If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Revelation. Today we'll, we'll continue our series. Has this been a helpful series to you? A discussion about the end times and eschatology and, and what the Bible has prophesied. And, you know, God wants his people to be prepared. We said that revelation is not to scare us, but to prepare us. And so our heart as pastors and leaders is to equip you in the days ahead. I know last week we took a break for Father's Day. Uh, we honored all the dads. Um, but today I want to jump back into the continuation of this series just to give you an overview. Originally, I think we were going to go four weeks. But how many know it's hard to squeeze Revelation into four weeks? So we've extended it, and we've got two more weeks. Uh, initially, we talked about the return of Christ and just an overview overview of, hey, prepare your heart for Christ's return. Then we talked about the throne room in Revelations chapter 4 and 5. It, it shows us a picture of God on his throne and all of the angelic beings. We talked about the sovereignty of God, even in a, a world of chaos and confusion. After that, we talked about the tribulation period, um, uh, chapters 6 through 10. We just stepped into that. And then where we left it was the two witnesses, the woman, and the dragon. Again, in the midst of the tribulation, you'll see a lot of imagery, symbolism, and pictures. And so today, I want to talk to you about the beasts and the mark. Okay, so the title of the message, because history makers are note takers, write this down, courageous living in a counterfeit world. Ooh, turn to your neighbor and say, I like that. Uh, courageous living in a counterfeit world. And again, there is so much to be said. Uh, we can't say it all on Sundays, but tomorrow there will be a podcast being released. I encourage you, the things that I don't get to say today, um, uh, you know, we, we can only do so much on a Sunday, but then we try to supplement that with these podcasts. And so that'll be released tomorrow. And so, so be watching for that. And then also we wanted to make a class available to you if you want further study and a deeper dive. Uh, so for the whole month of July, every Sunday, we will offer this revelation class. And so hopefully it's creating some great thought, great conversation and preparing your heart. Let's talk about courageous living in a counterfeit world. Uh, Revelation chapter 13. And before I, I read the text, I, I heard this recently. Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein was a brilliant man, an amazing physicist and scientist. In fact, he was Time Magazine's man of the century. Not just man of the year, man of the century. Albert Einstein was on a, a train leaving Princeton, and as he's seated in his seat, the conductor comes by punching tickets. And he comes up to, to Albert, and, and he asks for the ticket. Well, I, Albert was it's checking his pockets. He checked his shirt pocket, couldn't find it, checked his pants pocket. It wasn't there. He looked in his coat pocket. It wasn't there. Dug in his briefcase, couldn't come up with his ticket. The conductor said, it's okay, Mr. Einstein. I know who you are. Well, Albert Einstein was grateful, and so the conductor walked on past and was punching tickets, and before he left that car to go to the next car, he looked over his shoulder, and there he was. Einstein was digging up under his seat, and, and so the conductor rushed back to him and said, M -m Mr. Einstein, it's okay. You don't need a ticket. I know who you are. Einstein said, young man, I know who I am too. I just don't know where I'm going. Listen, as your pastor, I want you to know who you are. Come on, somebody. And I want you to know where you're going. In fact, when you know who you are in Christ, how many of you got your ticket punched? Come on, somebody. If you don't know where you're going, then today may be helpful for you. Revelation chapter 13, read with me starting in verse 1. John says this as he gets this picture. He sees these things happening. He says, I saw a beast rising up out of the sea. It had seven heads and ten horns with ten crowns on each horn. And written on each head were the names that blasphemed God. This beast looked like a leopard. Some might say leopard. But it had the feet of a bear, say bear. And the mouth of a lion, say lion. Can you imagine in your mind what this beast looks like? 
I mean horrific, but we'll see the symbolism of what John is describing here. And the dragon gave the beast his own power and throne and great authority. Verse three, I saw that one of the heads of this beast seemed wounded beyond recovery, but the fatal wound was healed. The whole world marveled at this miracle and gave allegiance to the beast. They worshiped the dragon for giving the beast such power. And they also worshiped the beast. Who is as great as the beast, they exclaimed. Who is able to fight against him? Now skip on down to verse 8. And all the people who belonged to this world worshiped that beast. They are the ones whose names were not written in the book of life that belongs to the lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. Can I have an amen for the reading of the word? Now, I want to kind of stroll through this chapter and a portion of the next chapter and give you four thoughts. And the first is this. I want you to write down the word attraction. Okay, write down the word attraction. Here's why this is important, because if you remember when we talked about the dragon, the woman and the child in chapter 12, remember how the dragon attacked the woman. We said the woman represented the nation of Israel or the people of God. This child that she gave birth to, it speaks of the Messiah and how Satan, the dragon, tried to attack the woman and her child, but God rescued both, brought the child up to heaven and took care of the woman in the wilderness. How many of you remember that from chapter 12? Well, notice this, that the strategy of the enemy has changed. Uh, the dragon attacks, but this beast attracts. Now, let me say it like this. If the devil can't attack you, he'll try to attract you. Some of you have been under attack and you have withstood and you have persevered. Notice that the, the enemy shifts his focus now. He raises up a, 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 this beast. Now the, the dragon is watching and the beast now is in full operation and he's trying to attract. The Bible says the whole world marveled at him and they worshiped him. They said, who is as great as this beast. It sounds just like the enemy. He uses the, 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 the tool of attraction to distract us. And remember when, when Jesus was in the wilderness and Satan came to him to tempt him? And one of the things Satan said was, hey, it, it, if you'll just bow down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Every kingdom that you see here on earth, what was the enemy doing? He was trying to attract Jesus. Satan always comes in a disguise. And we'll talk about this in just a moment. He has this copycat type spirit trying to mimic and imitate the things of God. We noticed that in the Garden of Eden, Satan came in the form of a serpent. In 1 Peter, the Bible says he is roaming about like a roaring lion. Now we read in, in Revelation where the, the, uh, the enemy is now a dragon. All these different forms to tempt us, to attack us, and to attract us, he's disguised. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14, Paul warns us, but I'm not surprised. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's no wonder that his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. In the end, they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. See, the beast is empowered by Satan, and he uses this, this tool of attraction. He offers people what they want and what they think they need. Now, here's who most scholars believe that this beast is. This is the Antichrist. This beast in, in Revelation is the Antichrist. He's a political figure. And he will come onto the world scene and he will try to attract world leaders and nations and governments with things that they want and think that they need. The Antichrist will offer peace. He'll offer prosperity. He'll offer security. If you notice, this beast, the Antichrist, has the same number of heads and horns as the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. And notice the Bible says that it's the dragon who gives the Antichrist. It's Satan who gives the Antichrist his power. 
Now notice what, what the scriptures describe this antichrist, this beast, to look like. Remember we said the leopard, the bear, the lion. If you go back to Daniel chapter 7, and you need to write that down, Daniel chapter 7. Write that down and read that later today or sometime this week. You will see similar things being said in Daniel chapter 7 as Revelation chapter 13. Notice in Daniel 7, the leopard is the Greek empire. The bear is the Persian empire. The lion is the Babylonian empire. And then there was another beast in Daniel 7. Fourth, this fourth beast was terrifying. He had 10 horns, and that was the Roman empire. This tells us that the Antichrist will come onto the scene as a political figure. Now, now notice it says this beast, he had a near fatal wound, but he miraculously recovered. Does that sound familiar? Anti-Christ. Some people think that this could be a cultural system. This is a, an ideology that opposes all things Christ. Let me say it this way. I've, I've said this before. The Antichrist has not been revealed in the earth yet. But the spirit of Antichrist is here already. How many of you can feel that? You can just, you see that, you sense that. I mean, culture has totally shifted, has it not? I mean, it's like we're calling wrong right and right wrong. Man, we're legislating things, and man, you're hearing conversations and dialogue that, that 20, 30 years ago you would have never entertained. But now it's almost normalized. I'll even say this, when it comes to entertainment, entertainment, once you consider the word entertainment, how does that word begin? With the word enter. Parents, be careful what you let into your home. Be careful what you let into your hearts. Be careful what you let into your kids. There is a culture that is anti-Christ. And there's, there's a growing hostility that's, that's coming against men and women of faith. And, and John sees this picture, and man, here comes this beast, and the whole world goes for it. You know, it tells me this, that if you and I are going to stand for Christ, there may be moments where we have to stand alone. We won't go with the flow. We're going to have to go against the flow. You know, and, 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 and people that have, you know, have bought into this, this system, this way of thinking, we got to make sure that we're not getting caught up in the culture or the current that opposes Jesus. Now, how, how do we do that? We anchor our lives in truth. You know, it, it, here's what's interesting. So many people are worshiping the Antichrist and the world system in this chapter. So many people adopt these values, and it almost seems as if everyone thinks this way. And for those who think differently, they're called hateful. They're called regressive. And, and they get classified in the shrinking minority. You know, I heard George Orwell, he made this statement. I, this is a great quote. He said, in a time of deceit, telling the truth becomes hate speech. Ooh, Selah. Meditate on this for a moment. In a time of deceit, telling the truth becomes hate speech. He also said, the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. Now, we're supposed to speak the truth in love, but truth is truth. And let's not be attracted to the ways of the world. Don't fall for the shiny things, the glitz, the glamour. How many of you know that not everything that glitters is gold? The enemy, if he can't attack, he'll attract. You know, last Sunday was Father's Day, and so with the dads of our family, we, we made a plan. Now, now, Rachel, she's almost done. She's on a 30-day liver detox. Have y'all ever been on a detox? Y'all have? Y'all are toxic people. <laughs> she's trying to do this liver detox, and her diet is very restrictive. I'm proud of my girl. She's got seven days left. Come on, 30 days. We got seven days left. <laughs> but my sweet baby is just eating stuff. And it's not like tasty stuff. It's like, you know, 
quinoa, roughage, twigs and sticks and acorns and I don't know what it is. It's just nasty, but she's got to eat it. And so, but bless her heart, she's been strong. But on Father's Day, I ain't eating quinoa. <laughs> so we made a plan, the guys and the dads in our family, hey, let's have a meat fest. We had tri-tip, we had ribeye, man, we had lamb chops, we had this Brazilian cut called pecanha. Come on, holegos, holegos. It was, I mean, we got the meat sweats. I, I was just, y'all, y'all better pray for your pastor. I think I was in a gluttonous state. We ate so much. But Rachel said, she's so smart. She said, look, y'all go to my parents' house. I'm going to go home and make my lunch, and I'm going to eat my, my acorns and my sticks and my, my, all my stuff. She got to the house, and guess what? She was so full that she wasn't even attracted. Come on, now, you, you, know, you know where I'm going with this. She looked at the lamb chops and didn't have any appetite for it. You know why? Because she was full of the right stuff. And listen, when you and I have an appetite for the things of God, we won't crave the things of the world. There won't be any room for us to be attracted or distracted by something that can destroy us. Come on, can somebody say amen? You see, this antichrist uses the tactic of attraction. Number two, write down the word deception. Somebody say deception. I want you to see how attraction and deception come together. Look at verse 11. Then I saw another beast, this is the second beast, that came up out of the earth. He had two horns like those of a lamb, but he spoke with the voice of a dragon. Notice that. Notice the symbolism and the parallels happening here. Verse 12, he exercised all the authority of the first beast, and he required that all the earth and its people to worship that first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching, verse 14. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform, now notice he was allowed, that tells me God's still in control, with all of the miracles that he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. If the first beast is the Antichrist, this second beast is the false prophet. Most people refer to, most scholars refer to this second beast as the false prophet. If the Antichrist was, is a political figure, the false prophet will be a religious figure. And I want you to see how it moves from attraction to deception, okay? Everything that God does, the devil tries to counterfeit. He tries to mimic. He tries to imitate for the point of deceiving. The Bible says that in the last day, days, even God's very elect will be deceived. Now, now, we know, I want you to consider this. We know the Trinity God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're very familiar with that. If you've been in church, you understand God the Father. And even at the very beginning in Genesis, he, he makes mention, he says, let us make man in our image, plural. There's this, this, this Trinitarian expression, God the Father, Jesus his Son, and then the power of the Holy Spirit that was poured out. But the devil that we call that the Holy Trinity. The devil has created this unholy trinity. The dragon, the first beast, and the second beast. The dragon, which is Satan. The second beast, which is the Antichrist. And, or the, the, the first beast, which is the Antichrist. And then the second beast, which is the false prophet. Notice, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Satan is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus the Son, Antichrist. I'm opposing everything that Jesus stands for. And then you have the false prophet who we just read, his primary purpose is to point people to the Antichrist so that they will worship him. And the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives is to point us to Jesus so that we will worship him. Are you seeing this? You seeing how the, the, the enemy counterfeits everything that's authentic about the kingdom? Let me say this. 
the best way for us as believers to stay out of deception is to be intimately familiar with the truth. Let me say that again. You don't have to study or chase the counterfeits that are out there. You need to study and be familiar with the truth of God's word. I mean, think about those that have counterfeited money. I mean, there's probably endless ways, endless different details and nuances to counterfeit U.S. currency. But you know what? Those who are in the counterfeit department aren't studying the fake things. They just know the real thing so well that the minute something different comes in its way, they say, ah, 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 that's not authentic. And you see, for us as believers, the, 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 the scripture describes that in the time of tribulation, the whole world will worship the Antichrist, and this false prophet will point people to the Antichrist and even do miraculous things. But you and I have to be so dialed in to the authenticity of this book. I believe that attraction and deception work hand in hand. It's the one two combination punch of the enemy. He'll try to attack us. If that doesn't work, then he tries to attract us. And and then in that attraction, we become deceived. In fact, I want you to write down this progression. It starts with a look. Okay. Write down the word look. And then it moves from the look to the lure. Once you look at it, out of curiosity, then you are lured and drawn in. It moves from the look to the lure, and then the next phase is the lust. Now we want. We deserve. We desire. It goes from look to lure to lust, and then it always ends in loss. Always. Not sometimes. Not most of the time, but always. And the devil never wants you to see the finish line of your decisions. He only wants to show you what's up front. I mean, didn't he do the same to Adam and Eve in the garden? Look at, the, look at that fruit. I can't believe that God said don't eat. Did God really say that? Look at this fruit looks delicious. And this fruit is, is nourishing. I mean, God knows that when you eat the fruit, you'll be just like him. God doesn't want what's best for you. He wants what's less for you. Eat the fruit. Eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. And then when they take a bite, then it's like the devil condemns and says, ha, ha, ha. Look at what you did. Come on, are you with me? And, and this deception, man, the Bible says the whole world goes after the Antichrist. I want you to consider this. It always ends in loss and destruction. Always. Please hear me. If you're being drawn away and tempted in an area right now, please hear your pastor. The, the, what's on the other side of that decision is destruction. It ends in loss. You say, Mike, what do you mean? How, how do you know? Look at Adam in the garden. He lost paradise. Look at Samson with Delilah. He lost his strength. Look at David with Bathsheba. He lost his son. You see, the devil is about destruction. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible says, The thief comes but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life that you might have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. Can somebody say amen? amen? You see, the devil never delivers. He only devours. 1 Peter 5, 8, the scripture reminds us, stay alert. Somebody say, wake up. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Come on, say attraction. Say deception. Say decision. Write that down. Number three, decision. Uh, look at verse 16. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, everyone to be given a mark. This is the mark of the beast. A mark on the right hand or on the forehead. No one could buy or sell anything without that mark which was either the name of the beast or the number representing 
his name. Verse 18, wisdom is needed here. Hey, church, you never get away from needing wisdom. Wisdom is need. I know sometimes there's a lot of conspiracies, a lot of thoughts, a lot of confusion about what this mark is, but the Bible reminds us, let's apply the biblical principles and exercise wisdom when it comes to the beast and this mark. Wisdom is needed here. Let the one with understanding solve the meaning of the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. The Greek word here is, the mark of the beast is either the number of man or the number of a man. Now, I want you to consider this, 666, the number six. What day of creation was man created on? The sixth day. On the sixth day, God created man. Now, seven is the number of perfection, the number of completion. Six is the number of man. That tells me that you and I, even at our best, are incomplete. Six is the number of men. Now notice there are three sixes. Six, six, six. Three is the number of fullness. Three. That means that the fullness of humanity, the fullness of man is represented by this number. Here's the lie that the enemy will give us. That the only way we can survive is to think and act like man. The number of a man. And the, the, the Antichrist will offer this number as a measure to control. The Bible says there's no buying or selling apart from this number. Those who are going to stand and endure have to resist thinking like the world. When the Bible says you and I are citizens of a kingdom that's not of this world. You know, in the end times, there will be a lot of attraction, a lot of deception, but people will have to make decisions. And I want to say this, you need to go ahead and make some decisions right now. Man, we're, I know things are confusing and chaotic, but during the tribulation period, man, it's going to, the Bible says, unless that, those days are cut short, all of men will be destroyed. We need to decide ahead of time where our loyalties are where our commitment is, you know, where our allegiance is. I'm not saying this to scare anybody, but I'm saying this to, to encourage us. If you make decisions ahead of time, your convictions will guide you when chaos begins to come in. I'm not guided by emotions. I'm not guided by the world system. Man, I've made a covenant, a commitment to the Lord. Now, where does this mark go? It's interesting. Here's a cool parallel. Where does this mark go? The mark of the beast on the right hand or on the forehead. Okay. What does the hand represent? The things we put our hand to, it represents our doing. What does the forehead represent? Our thinking. Notice how the enemy wants to create a structure that influences what we think and the things that we do. You know that your thoughts and your actions are connected. If you think wrong thoughts, you're going to do wrong things. But if you have the mind of Christ, come on, somebody. Man, if you think in a different realm, you're going to respond in a different way. Come on, are you catching this? This is so important. Now, now, now here's what's fascinating, okay? The, the, the mark goes either on the hand or on the forehead. Deuteronomy 6, okay? This is what the Jewish community calls the Shema. And it's literally known as, it's translated to hear. This will sound familiar. Watch this, Deuteronomy 6, 4. The Bible says, hear or listen, O Israel, for the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all of your strength. You must commit yourselves. Come on, there's conviction right there. There's decision. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving to you this day. Verse 8, tie them where? To your hands. Wear them on your what? Forehead as reminders this day. This is called the Shema. This is the Jewish version of the Lord's Prayer. This is the Old Testament version of the Lord's Prayer. And now in the end of days, in the tribulation period, Satan is trying to counterfeit with the anti-Shema. 
Instead of God's word being on our hands and written on our foreheads, he's trying to take his mark and stamp out everything God's word says. Listen to me, beloved. We've got to cling to this book. Man, I, I, I pray that we're a church that is always built on the foundation of the authenticity of God's Word. And God's Word can be an anchor to us in crazy days, in difficult days. Man, when your emotions are all over the place, don't let go of this book. Man, the Bible says, man, tie it to your hands and wear it on your foreheads. God's Word on me, in me, around me, before me. The book. How many of you have made a decision to honor God and His Word? Well, let me give you this last thought then. Number four. Somebody say attraction. Say deception. Say decision. Number four, celebration. Oh, this is good. Revelation 14, the Bible says this. Then I saw the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were 144,000, watch this, who had his name and his father's name written where? Oh, yeah. You can't stamp out the purposes of God. Man, when, when God writes his name and his, the name of the lamb and his father on your forehead, the devil can't erase. He can't stamp it out. He can't block it or blot it out. His name was written on their foreheads. And I heard a sound, verse 2, from heaven like the roar of a mighty ocean wave, like the rolling of loud thunder. It was like the sound of many harpists playing together. And this great choir sang a wonderful new song. They sang it in front of the throne of God before the four living beings and the 24 elders. Watch this. No one could learn this song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. I love it. God put his name on their foreheads and put a song in their heart. And it was a song that no one could learn except for them. Do you know that God can give you a joy that nobody understands? A joy that doesn't make sense? And even when, when, when your health is failing you, God can give you a joy. Even when finances uh, is, seem to be broken and you just, man, you're just trying to figure it out as you go, God can put a joy in your heart. Man, even when you're under attack at work, when relationships seem to be falling apart, God says, I'll put my name on their forehead and a song in their heart. The truth is this. Listen to me. What the world gives you through attraction and deception, the world can take from you. But this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Come on, if you believe that, put your hands together.